the person's life start falling apart because all they do is that. Meaning I, I showed up late to work today because I was scrolling Instagram or another thing like that. Time just goes and people fail to realize just how long they've spent on digital media and it just stops them engaging with mm -hmm. things that need to be done. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing, being good people. Hello everybody and welcome to Good People episode 47. Today I was joined by Professor Phil Reed. He is a professor of psychology at Swansea University. Most of his research centers around the ideas of learning and behavior, but in today's episode, we talked about digital dependence and high social media use. In today's episode, expect to learn about what social media addiction is, the difference between compulsive and addictive behavior, some of the social and emotional impacts of high social media use, and the cognitive implications as well. Step back in time with the Rockingham Vintage Baseball Club. A new adult recreational league is forming in Rockingham County, Virginia. Transport yourself to 1864 as we revive the spirit of the early days of baseball. No baseball experience is required, just a love for the game or a willingness to try something new. Join them for their first practice on Saturday, March 16th at 11 a.m. behind the Elkton Community Center. You can also find them on Facebook at Rockingham Vintage Baseball Club for more information and get ready to step up to the plate. I will also attach the link to the Facebook group in the description below. If you guys are watching on YouTube before the show starts, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on our notifications so you don't miss our weekly uploads. When you interact with our channel, it really does help us grow this thing, and we appreciate it and you. Enjoy the show. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to do this, and, and welcome to the show. No problem at all. Thanks very much for having me. So uh, internet addiction is a topic that I've been pretty fascinated with for a, a very long time. Um, I am, I'm 23 years old. I was born in the year 2000. I got my first smartphone when I was 13 or 14 years old, I think. Um, and so this is something that's been integrated uh, in my life for you know pretty much as long as I can remember. I will say I, I kind of self-admit to um, being of the last people where I at times enjoyed going outside more than being on my phone and, and, and that sort of thing. You know, I think social media, especially recently has changed quite a bit um, in, in terms of its, its use and the addictive qualities of it. Um, but nonetheless, you know, anybody born now or in the last 15 years will never, you know, live in a time where, where, where technology at this level isn't and, and internet isn't integrated as, as part of our being. And so, um, I'm super excited today to talk to you about this, but um, can you give me a little bit of information on, you know, what it is that you research? I understand you also look at other things other than uh, internet addiction, but a brief overview of, of all of the areas of research that you are fascinated with. I've got very broad interests. Um, I suppose the thing that, that unites them all is the way that our interactions with our environment shape our behavior. So anything that's a major part of that environment, such as, digital technology becomes of, of interest to me. So I'm, I'm interested in, in basic processes of learning, but also how that impacts things like um, how we deal with people who have some challenges maybe or are neurodiverse, helping them adapt to the environment and vice versa, which is just as important. Um, but also, as you're quite rightly saying, the the influence of, of digital technology and all its guises now is so pervasive in our society and, and people of your age uh, and even younger now um, just haven't really experienced a world without these things. And that, that becomes a big part of, of what people do every day. There, there is one thing I would, would possibly take issue with, um, with, with what you're saying. Um, you're quite right to say that the, this, this technology is utterly pervasive 
in our society. I'm, I'm not as convinced that it is fully integrated into our lives. It, it seems to me that it's, um, it's still sort of standing a little bit outside what we do. And it's, it's an influence on us rather than being something we just use like a tool. Um, I, I'm not quite sure we've found yet a way to integrate it and live with it in a, in a, in a harmonious way without it doing um, at least some damage. That's not to say that it can't do some good as well. It clearly does um, witness a pandemic and, and how that managed to keep us connected. But on the whole, um, I, I think it's possibly more negative than positive. And we, we haven't quite yet figured it out. Why do you think it's more negative than positive? Just looking at the way that it, it impacts people in terms of sorry, mental health, uh, we're seeing far more anxiety in, in people who are younger than, than was ever the case now. And a lot of the time when you talk to them, and you, you, they, do, they do the experiment for themselves, they, they'll stop using social media or stop using social media as much as they used to, or cut off news feeds or cut off any feed for that matter. And they find themselves significantly less anxious and, and paradoxically more connected to people than they are when they are multiply digitally connected. Mm. There is a, uh, I can't remember her name. Um, she is a researcher at the University of Virginia and she is releasing a book later this year, and she uses this term called, I've pre-ordered it. I'm so excited to read it. She uses this term called connective labor. And basically her, you know, the idea is that there are certain jobs that we are, we are automating, particularly, um, you know, low skill jobs, like, like a clerk at a, at a grocery store. And she says, and, and the argument she's making in the book is that those roles in, in interacting with your clerk at the grocery store have much more of an impact on your well-being, your emotional health than you realize because something as small as when you're checking out and, and they say, did you find everything okay? And you say, yes, I did. Thank you. And then, you know, they maybe ask you about your day, whatever the case may be. That small interaction of looking somebody in the eye and, and, and being engaged and perhaps to your point. Uh, pulling out of the social media, the technological social world um, leads us to, you know, better health outcomes for that very reason, lower anxiety, um, more connectedness, more feelings of fulfillment. You just better, feel better about your experience of life. So it's interesting that, you know, you, you sort of come to these same conclusions on your own. I, I, I couldn't agree more that these, these minor little interactions that, that appear relatively trivial a kind of what makes up a day-to-day -day life. Um, and especially if you think of people who might not otherwise have that range of social connections that, that many of us do have. Um, those of us who are, who are lucky enough to, to be in employment or be at work, we, we tend to have a, a very wide range of acquaintances and connections. Uh, and, and we speak to people all the time, perhaps wishing sometimes we didn't have to quite speak to so many people all the time. <laughs> but if you can imagine perhaps somebody who is, who is older and maybe have lost relatives or have lost significant others um, and are feeling isolated, that interaction with the, uh, the person working in the shop might be one of the few times they actually talk to somebody during the day. So there is, there is that, that very important group of people who we may just be forcing into greater isolation. And that can cause all sorts of problems. And then there's the other people who are, who are trying to disconnect from the world. And, and there are such groups of people, um, usually as a coping strategy, because they are, they are suffering with some particular um, problem or, or mental health problem and finds... They, they think a solution in just withdrawing from everybody because then they don't have to face some of the challenges. Um, and that might work for a, a short period of time, but it creates even more problems. And in some of them, it can create resentment about the rest of society. And that, that can become functionally very dangerous. 
So just keeping people aware that other people exist, there are other living beings in the world, uh, and you can say hello to them once in a while, does just keep some level of connectedness there. And, and I think I, I think that's, that analysis is, is very important. We should not underestimate that that apparently trivial smile or hello that we say to people. It make, you, we all experience that. If someone smiles at us, someone says hello, we feel better. Um, and, and that does contribute to our well-being. Are you familiar with uh, terror management theory? No, I can't say I am. So it is a uh, communications theory. I've actually interviewed a lady um, on the show about this before. But basically, I can't remember the the birth of the theory, but it, it sort of turned into something else. And it has become a theory centered around the idea of your acceptance of death. And there are three elements to it. Element number one is your cultural worldview which is basically just your values, you know, what you believe in. There's other like environmental and biological factors that obviously affect that. Um, And then there's your self-esteem and they define that as, are you living up to your cultural worldview? And then the third element, and this was always the most surprising to me, was you have to have close relationships. So as long as you have a clear set of values and you are feeling as though for the most part, you live up to them and you have people to share those things with, then you will feel more positively positively of your own mortality compared to other people. And I think um, culture, culturally, I know you and I have, have some differences, but, but largely for the Western world, you know, I think that the, the slow pull to the individualization of things is a, is a mistake that we are now starting to see uh, the result, the unintended consequences of. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that's quite interesting. There's quite a lot to unpack there. And I think that, that our relationship with the digital would, would have some implications for that. There, there are really two aspects to, to relationships, if, if we want to put it this way. There's a, a kind of a breadth sort of relationship and a depth. Um, and loneliness or social isolation, um, which which may feed into a, a support, getting rid of some of that um, existential terror, I suppose is is what they're they're, they're talking about. Um, can be can be got rid of by either, but it's much more likely to be um, to be reduced by that close emotional bond. Um, so it, it's the depth relationship with maybe one or two other significant others mm. that's, um, that really does help. It's not to say that a wider range of acquaintances also can't, can't help a little bit, um, but it's not quite so important as having a single relationship. And of course, digital communication is set up for breadth mm. rather than depth. Um, so it, it's pulling us to that. Uh, I know people argue that digital communication can actually increase the the number of people you are acquainted with, and that may be well the case. But those relationships don't have a a significant depth to them uh, in the way that might might help us remove some of that that concern and terror about mortality or or existence. Right. How would you define social media addiction? It's not about how much you use it. Um, It's partly about what you're using it for. Mm. I think that's important. And it's partly about the effects on your everyday life. And it's also partly about what you experience when you're not using it. So to take those in reverse order, um, any addiction is definable by both a buildup of tolerance. That means that you need more and more of it over time in order to get the same effect. Typically, we associate that with, with substance use, but it can also go for, for many behavioral or, or process addictions, gambling or pornography or digital usage. You also get withdrawal effects. 
when you're not using the the device. Um, and they can be both psychological and physiological. Psychologically, you certainly see an increased anxiety, an increased depression, which you can literally chart from the moment that you stop using your phone. Um, it grows from minute one and it peaks at around 15 minutes after you've um, failed to connect. But that's mirrored physiologically as well, and you'll get a, an increase in nervous system activity, your heart rate will go up, um, your blood pressure will go up, you'll start sweating, um, all of the indices of anxiety. As a corollary of that, and maybe we can get to this later, um, you will also see an increase in the stress hormone cortisol. Um, Cortisol has, has a great function. Um, if you're fleeing from an incident, um, it, it suppresses a lot of your physical activity and just allows all of your energy to go to the bits that allow you to run away. But it's not meant to last long. And prolonged cortisol exposure can suppress the immune system. Um, mm. So you find people getting increased upper respiratory tract infections. Um, as a result of, of digital addictions. It also crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it's known to impact on a number of brain areas that we can see implicated in all of the cognitive problems, depression, anxiety, uh, impulse control, that go with um, excessive digital use. Are you talking about, when you say cross the blood-brain barrier, are you talking about addiction specifically as a characteristic? Um, certainly any addiction that produces a stressful withdrawal ah. response will will impact that. Um, so it impacts the amygdala, it will impact the hippocampus, it will impact the, the prefrontal cortex. So amygdala associated with emotional regulation, hippocampus associated with memory, and the prefrontal cortex associated with higher functions like uh, control of inhibitions. So all of those are significantly impacted in people who have um, digital addictions. So we've got those, those effects in terms of what happens when you're not using it, both psychological and physical. The, the impact on the rest of your life is perhaps the most noticeable in that it stops you doing other things that you want to do. So you would rather go on your phone, perhaps, than spend time with intimate partners. You would prefer digital excitement to real world excitement. It might start interfering with school or work because you're spending all your time um, doing digital things. And that's true of most addictions, and that's what really gets noted, that the person's life starts falling apart because all they do is there. Meaning I, I showed up late to work today because I was scrolling Instagram or another thing like that. Time just goes, and people fail to realize just how long they've spent on digital media. And it just stops them engaging with things that need to be done. That's, that's often what gets noticed by other people. Um, and it's usually the other people who start flagging that up. And it's not really until the, the addict hits rock bottom that they themselves know they've got a problem. It's very difficult to see that yourself. Mm. And of course, if you've excluded all your significant others because you spend all your time on in the digital world, nobody is going to tell you that. Um, so that's, that's a double whammy in terms of um, digital addiction. I, I'm curious what, you know, this is, this is a, a human thing. There are negative things that we do that we engage with, behaviors that we have that we engage with all the time that are not good for us. Eating poor quality food, not exercising frequently enough, engaging too often with the digital world. What are some of the systems behind why we continue to, to engage in this? Is it some sort of 
you know, easy reward pattern? You know, what, what's, what's underneath all of this? I think there are probably two, two things that are, that are underlying this. The first is what a lot of people really focus on, and that's the nature of the, the thing to which we're addicted. In this case, it's um, social media. Uh, and as we all know, there's, there's plenty of literature now that says things like likes and, and being shared and being re, I was going to say uh, retweeted, but uh, what, what, that may be a bit old fashioned now. Those, those types re-ex. of, uh, yeah, re-exed, um, those types of um, affirmation from others are, are very, very rewarding um, and they can produce uh, all sorts of neurochemical changes, which which function like like little mini rewards, and those systems have been set up to to optimally share with us when we have had some kind of social reward. And there's, there's plenty of work that's been done on that, but I have a feeling that much more importantly, it's not so much the positive rewards that are driving this. But I think these these strategies are often avoidance. Most forms of addiction um, have started off as a way of coping with a a stressful situation. Indeed, most forms of of behavioural problems um, have started off as a a way of alleviating a problem. Um, We can can imagine that with things like um, self-harm to take a, a, a really strong example of this. Um, the adolescence, usually adolescent girl who self-harms, isn't necessarily self-harming um, because they like it and isn't necessarily self-harming because they want attention, but often that self-harm acts as an escape from an intolerable situation. So while they're feeling the the pain of um, a self-harming situation, they are altering their environment Mm. so that the the influence of equally aversive stimuli are not felt quite so so strongly. So in in some ways, what looks like an incredibly maladaptive behaviour is in fact quite adaptive initially for that individual obviously the longer it persists it doesn't necessarily fulfill the same function but it still is there it becomes habitual Mm. what is a what is a common example for people that that get this way with social media use what what common holes are people filling um, in their lives it can it can be a whole range of things for most people I think it's a a sort of form of procrastination. You've Mm. got this big job that you need to do and it's not something you really want to do, but you can, you can kid yourself that reading through your WhatsApp messages or, or your Facebook or your Twitter or your Snapchat is, is equally important work, uh, Mm. which must be done. And, and you, you can while away a couple of hours doing that and not have to deal with the source of the stress that's mm. that's actually sitting there. So it, it's, it can be coping in that way, and that's relatively trivial. For other people, perhaps they are facing a, a real social isolation. Maybe they simply do not have anybody in their lives. And I... I, I, I very few excuses for using the word real real life and digital life i don't i just do not see those two things as the same um and so they reach out to the digital world and they make their digital connections and it alleviates that loneliness for a time but never quite replaces what they're they're looking for and so they 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 go back to that it can be avoidance it can be a substitution but in all cases it's trying to to remove a source of stress Mm. in someone's life and 
I think that more than the actual thing in itself is really important. And, and, and Freud knew this. Um, if you look at Freud, he said, well, we can treat, we can treat an addiction. Um, not that he wanted his own addiction to cigars particularly treated, but we can, we can treat somebody else's addiction um, and I can stop you drinking. But unless I really get to the root of why you're drinking, something else is just going to replace it. Mm. Um, so we can look at social media but and we can we can avert someone to social media but unless we get at the root cause of why they're vulnerable to that then they're just going to do something else perhaps equally as, as damaging to their well-being mm. i interviewed a um a woman named linda hancock for the show and she works um she's in her 60s now she was a 30 year career as a family nurse practitioner. And she now educates young people on various behavioral health outcomes. And she has that same perspective. I can't remember who she quoted when she said it, but, but it was too often we ask why the problem, but we should be asking why the pain. And uh, I think that that's sort of the same perspective that you're sharing. Yeah. I mean, social media is obviously a, the, a, it's not, I wouldn't even say it's a new thing now. I was going to say it's a new thing. I don't think that's true anymore. It's 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 an evolving thing. It's mm-hmm. it's a major thing, uh, and it attracts a lot of attention in itself. But it's it's only one part of the issue. It's it's like saying, well, let let's try and study all these designer drugs for the the sake of studying the designer drug. It's not really the issue. The issue is why is somebody taking it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if not, if not this drug, then another drug. Um, if not X, then Snapchat. It, it doesn't really matter. It's it's the the underlying cause that, that can get missed a little bit in all of this. Mm. I've heard the perspective that social media use is often more compulsive than it is addictive. Um, you know, what is your perspective on that? You know, where where do you fall in with that with that uh, perspective? It certainly can be both. Um, the, the, the difference, um, a compulsion doesn't really have withdrawal. But ultimately, to the person's life, apart from not experiencing those unpleasant physical and, and psychological effects when they don't use it, it looks the same. So you, you spend as much of your life on it with a compulsion as you do with an addiction. Uh, it interferes as much. It will be as harmful to your to real social connections. So functionally, does it matter? Probably not. Um, but I, I agree there are there are differences in mechanism mm. underlying the two. Um, there are both going round. Um, clinically from from the perspective of the the person who is the subject of the overuse let's just call it that um i don't think it matters that much yeah you, you know whatever gets you there it probably comes out as the net the same time use and if it's impacting you negatively um certainly the the outcomes are are probably fairly similar talk to me about some of these outcomes i'm curious um I know, I know most of social media addiction has looked more at social and emotional implications. I think most recently you've looked a little bit at the cognitive side of things. Um, but, but give me a rundown of some of the, the short-term and long-term outcomes of high social media use, social media addiction. Yeah. Um, like most addictions, social media um, overuse is, is associated with a whole range of uh, emotional issues. So, we certainly see increase in heightened anxiety. We see increased depression, often often connected with a lack of social interaction in the real world. Um, in extreme cases, we can see the development of psychoses uh, and a disconnection from reality, but that thankfully is is relatively rare. We can also see, depending on the type of usage, um, connections with 
narcissism traits, especially a, a kind of a, in some cases, a grandiose narcissism. Um, interestingly, different forms of social media are differentially connected with that. So overuse of visual social media, such as selfie posting, um, can lead to the development of, of narcissistic traits. Why is that? That's so fascinating to me. Yeah, it, it, it's, I, I don't think we really know why, why that's the case. Um, partly, I think it's because people can do it and they, they don't necessarily experience the, the, direct, the direct comments of our friends. <laughs> if, if we start acting um, a, little bit, a little bit grandiosely, um, in the presence of, of our friends, <laughs> then they usually tell us. Meaning like there's like, a bit of a disconnect between when you get the feedback, you know, if you, if you're acting, uh, you know, you, you have this high self importance or belief of self importance in, in, if you were to engage in the real world, your, your friends would, would shoot you down, like humble you in a sense. Yeah, I think so. Ah. So there's not that naturally occurring, um, Bar a sort of a break that's put on that behavior. Uh, interestingly enough, for, for more textual forms of, of social media, people high in narcissism to begin with seem to be drawn to those forms of a communication. So it's not that they create the narcissism, but interestingly, pre-existing narcissists seem to be drawn to communicate in a in a kind of textual way. Um, mm. Again, probably because they can say whatever they want and they, they don't really get the, um, the barriers and the breaks mm. put on. So that there's a whole range of psychological and emotional issues with this. Socially, the key issue is increased loneliness um, and social isolation. Um, it is not a substitute for real world interaction. Um, during the pandemic, it was, of course, incredibly useful as a substitute, but we all knew at some point we would emerge from that. Um, so we kind of, this, this isn't going to be it forever. This is horrible, but we can get through this mm. for the time being. If you don't see an end to it, that's a very different matter. So increased increased um, isolation and loneliness are, are key key things. Have you looked into that at all? Was there is there a connection between, you know, perhaps because we knew at some point that this thing was going to hopefully come to an end that we were we felt more positively about it? You know, because yeah. I, I do remember a lot of the messaging at the time during the pandemic was like, we'll get through this. There was a sort of unity in that. Um, mm -hmm. Have, is there research on that? Have you ever looked at that as a phenomenon in and of itself? Yeah, we, we did. Um, it's one of those things. We, we did publish something on that a couple of years ago um, in which we, we'd, we'd fortuitously just done a study looking at the, the effects of, of social media use and loneliness. And this was just before the pandemic. Um, and we repeated that study during the pandemic and found completely different results. So whereas with, in the absence of, of lockdown regulations, then increased social media use did lead to increased loneliness. But during the pandemic, it didn't. Mm. Um, so um, you've always got to temper these great sweeping statements um, that with, we have a tendency to make, like social media makes you lonely. Um, yeah, well, certainly, you hard. know, like we wouldn't be having this conversation if it were not were not for the pandemic. You know the the digital communication, the the Zoom meetings. I'm sure you probably engage in. I I took two or three semesters of of university online. You know, and but but to that point, and what's what pulls me in is I love having these kinds of conversations because I'll go tell my friends about it or my fiance about it. You know, look listen to this cool thing that I learned today. And I would hope that people that listen to the show would also do the same where they, where they're engaging in this conversation. Hopefully, you know, they feel like they're, they're sort of at having a seat at the table and listening in, but then, you that, know, no, it's, it's fantastic for that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, 
I don't want to come over as all negative about it. It's it's it, like any other tool. It has the most wonderful usage. We can communicate across the Atlantic in a ways that the it's, it's a, we could do by by telephone, but it's not quite the same as looking someone in the eye mm. um, and having a conversation. It, and it's it's allows all sorts of communication to occur. But we often don't use it for, for these types of things. We, we often use it for, I'm going to the shop. Um, I'm now buying the pint of milk. Um, and I do, 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 we don't really need to know. Um, it, it's like trying to use a hammer for everything. Mm. It's not the purpose of the tool. So it's getting the usage right. When we get the usage right, I, I'm all for it. It's, it's a wonderful communication device. I just don't think we get it right very much. I, I think also as an extension of, of your regular life too, to, to draw back my earlier example, it's easy for me because I actually get to have these conversations, but you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I do the same thing. If I'm listening to a show and I, when I stumble upon a cool piece of information, usually my first instinct is to tell somebody about it because it's an opportunity to have that connection. So I think you're onto something, right? You just have to be a little bit more in tune with the way that you're using some of these tools. You can, um, Really interesting. If you, if you delve back into the into the, the research when um, when TV was first becoming a mass medium, uh, there were all sorts of, of broadly similar concerns expressed about this this new form of um, of communication, albeit one way, that it would it would isolate people. But one of the things that that old fashioned TV used to do when there were there were a few networks available is it would give everyone a shared experience at the same time and there, there was there was mm. something important about that that it built almost a a shared consciousness mm. um, within the world so millions of people would be watching the same event at the, the very same time and the next day they didn't even have to raise, or oh, did you see this, or I've just seen it. It was there for all of them, and they could get on with talking about it. Digital communication has both increased our choice, which means we can watch what we want when we want to, and there's so much to be said for that. But it's decreased that sense of social connectiveness, because what you've watched, you can't guarantee that somebody else has watched um, and that can be good, it can be bad, but it doesn't immediately produce a sense of, of shared community. Um, right. You can that's build it. I was going to just say, that's interesting because I listened to a show called Modern Wisdom. It's one of the biggest podcasts in the world right now. It's got like 2 million subscribers on YouTube, however many millions of listens across each episode. And that technically is a very small number. And the amount of people who I still in real life, I'm like, hey, have you listened to this show? And they're like, no, I've literally never heard of it. I'm like, what? This is the this is like the biggest show ever. And so that's that's a, I, I never really considered that. Yeah. But, and, and when you consider to some of those events, which still draw a, a large number of people to watch them, usually now, admittedly, um, sport related. Um, so if you think of of Olympics or, or in the in in your country, the Super Bowl, or in, in our country, for the, the Americans, Super final. Bowl, yeah, <laughs> or the, the 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 FA Cup final in the UK. It, it's it's usually around those things that you you get a a, a sense of community building. Um, whereas there are some some very very popular podcasts. You're quite right, but the numbers pale in comparison to, to the mass media. Um, and it, it just does something to erode the, the level of connectiveness. Um, and, I, and I think that that's quite important in, in, not, in having some kind of shared understanding of, of what somebody else might have experienced. Um, and as we know, with, with all sorts of things, Developing an understanding of what it's like to be the other person 
is is so important and, and we talk about diversity these days and one of the the key things is is understanding varying perspectives which might come from from generational influences on an individual which will make their their perspective and therefore their experience of the world a bit different and in order to get more connectivity between that that diversity so that we're not all diverse on our own which is which is awful um, but we can be diverse as we want and value that but also be connected to others there's got to be some level of of shared knowledge or experience that we can fall back on and if we're all doing our our own thing at the time we want to do it uh, and not necessarily communicating or communicating fully with another, then we never quite bridge those gaps. And full communication usually usually requires some level of, of shared understanding hmm. of, of what we're, we're getting at. Okay. Talk to me about the cognitive side of this. This is something that I'm pretty fascinated by. And for whatever reason, I feel like you know, I think it's pretty general knowledge that reliance on media uh, heavily being involved in the digital world does result in a lot of these social and emotional drawbacks. But for whatever reason, a lot of people don't let that inform their decision making. Um, you know, it is what it is. Of course, we're anxious and um, desperate and lonely. You know, these are just traits that we've sort of come to to deal with, unfortunately. But for whatever reason, I feel like if when people see that, that there's a lot of cognitive or, or perhaps cognitive drawbacks to high social media use, at least for me, that makes me go, oh, I don't, I don't want to be influencing my behavior or functioning uh, in, in a negative way. And, and this just maybe prompts me to be a little bit more proactive in limiting my social media use. So tell me about the cognitive side of things. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting for, for a number of reasons. But the main cognitive issues... Um, are around memory and attention. Um, in terms of attention, what we know is increased usage for the most part, um, there are some exceptions to this, but increased usage of, of social media um, and increased usage of digital devices for, oh, in, in educational terms will actually reduce people's attention span um, so we, we find it much more difficult to stay engaged with a particular task um, largely it looks like because we've been conditioned up to to attention switch between lots of incoming um, social media events so mm. it's very difficult to stay focused on one train of thought before yet another another deluge of WhatsApps on something else that we must look at now pops up. And so we're almost trained, we almost learn to, to cope with this by rapidly attention switching, mm. which ultimately reduces our ability to pay attention to um to one thing for a period of time if you push that too far and if you if you immerse yourself in a in an utterly chaotic digital world where you may have six or seven platforms and and they're all active you will overload and the only way to deal with an overload is is really to completely shut down and tunnel vision so we, we attention hop, we attention hop, we attention hop as much as we can. And at some point, our ability to juggle all of these social media platforms together can't cope with the input. And we just shut down and we narrow. And now we're looking at one thing because we can't cope with anything else. We don't want to know. We shut down. And that mimics what you actually get with people with an autism spectrum condition. Mm. 
it's it's almost a coping response for for a world which is too confusing too busy um and too aversive and you see this a lot with with people with news feeds how many times have you i've, I've shut it all down um i, I can't cope with it I, I don't want it on now and in, instead of deciding which they value they basically just uh, just turn their back on all of it and uh, they become completely disengaged mm. so i had this conversation with a, is one i was just gonna say i had this conversation with a friend of mine um last week but he sharing similar story where he he was like i just deleted all the things off my phone my my anxiety levels have reduced and so are you proposing that this is a, a natural response to almost a prolonged heightened use of social media. The, the, I think most people could relate to that where, you know, you you're on Instagram and you scroll and then you close it and then you click Facebook and then you scroll and then you close it. And then you go to TikTok and you scroll and you close it. And then you go back to Instagram, you know, hoping something else is that you didn't see before is on there. And then you just sort of repeat this loop. Yeah. And, but eventually that, that attention switching, becomes overwhelming and i think mm. it is a, a very natural coping response to an overwhelming situation um in the short term it's quite effective because we do see this uh removal of anxiety in the longer term it might become maladaptive to disconnect completely because we're not now getting any information about the world um, yeah. and we can become isolated um, or the other the other thing that we, we often see is the, the development of an echo chamber where the only thing that people can cope with is people expressing the same views as themselves which they'll just, they'll just go to the one chat room um, because everybody is, is saying the same thing and so oh, isn't, isn't everything terrible and isn't the world horrible and isn't this the only group that's that's uh, that's useful for us um we've got to band together um and, and that can develop a kind of collective narcissism mm. um where where the only way to survive is to belittle everybody else what's the solution for that then if if, if people find themselves in this pattern of this loop of using and then they completely shut off and then perhaps revisit it again in the future maybe at a at a lower use but then obviously because of the nature of this addictive quality it builds back up again and then perhaps they completely distance themselves what what are some solutions to getting out of that i think one of them is you, you mentioned towards the start of this when you were talking about knowing about your own values and your own value system and it's it's knowing why you're using social media and perhaps in one of those periods where you're not caught up in it all but you've got a little bit of time away from it you could consider what's the purpose of me using social media what is it that i want to get out of it what what are the benefits and then make the decision that that's what you're going to use it for and nothing else so you've got an ability to to harness the the quite patently obvious power of of this informational tool, but not necessarily get sucked into all of it because you know why you're using it. You know what the purpose is. It's like using a tool for DIY, if if indeed you you do that kind of thing. Um, not that, not that I would necessarily know the difference between a, a hammer and a chisel myself, but I'm told there is one. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm told you use them from entirely different functions. Um, and it's, it's, it strikes me that that's the same with social media. Mm. What is it you want from this? And I think once you've got that clear in your own mind, it becomes a lot easier not to get sucked into the stuff that just isn't isn't relevant to you. Hmm. It, it perhaps requires a little bit of revisiting. You know, I, I, I went all of 2023, I didn't drink any alcohol. And I've since I 
have started consuming alcohol again. I turned into a bit of a degenerate and I drank most days of January uh, upon my return. But, you know, now it's in a very reasonable place. I, for the same reasons, have thought logically about my alcohol use. What do I want it for? I enjoy having a drink or two with my friends or, or, or my fiance after a long day or whatever the case may be. But it's, I, I never come at it from this place of I'm drinking excessively for a certain feeling or, or conclusion. I know why I'm drinking it. And, and certainly there are times when I'm like, oh, I could have a drink right now, but it's a little bit easier for me to step in and say, you know, that doesn't really line up with, I got a long day at work tomorrow, better not. I want to get a good night's sleep. Okay. I won't have it. And it sounds I think like that's absolutely right because you know what, what you value, you know, what your goals are and you have, have rationally decided this is what I want to do. Um, and there's nothing wrong with people doing something because they want to do it in a, in a manner that they can control. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, there, there are very few things which of their very nature harm ourselves or others. There are some, but they're, they're, they're thankfully few and far between. And most of the things we're talking about, social media use or alcohol use, um, are not necessarily in themselves damaging, so long as they're not taken to excess. But because of their nature, it's quite easy sometimes to take them to ex excess, especially if we've got other things going on that aren't so good in our lives and we find escape from them. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's quite right. That, that process that you describe of re-evaluation during a period where your usage is, is not excessive or out of control, where you are, you're cognitively able to reason through what the purpose is, is probably one of the best steps towards controlled usage of something. Mm, that's a very interesting perspective. And, in, you know, whatever vice you have, I think that that's something that I can anecdotally relate a lot to. If, if there's any behavior that I had, and I'm not talking about anything major here, just uh, alcohol is a good example. I've never consumed it in a horribly negative way that's really impacted the outcome of my life. But there have been times when once I created space from the habit, I was able to really reflect and say, you know, that probably wasn't the best usage of that. And so I, that's a, that's a very interesting perspective. I like that creating some distance. Um, so you can, so you can think about it logically. Yeah. And it, it's got, it's got to come from you as we were talking about before. Um, friends and family can point this out to people, but it, it's, it's not usually either taken very well or even heard. Mm. It, it's really got to come from the person themselves and they've got to be in that place where they can take control and ownership of the issue and relate it to the rest of their life. Um, they may or they may not want this activity in their life, but if they do, that's fine. They've got to figure out what it is that they need it for. But also remember there are other things, other things they value. And if they do this one thing, maybe social media or whatever it is, to the exclusion of those others, they're going to diminish themselves. They're going to be less than that which they can be. Thinking about some of these memory and cognitive and focus functions that social media addiction seems to inhibit, are people who perhaps already have lower focus and memory and, and impulse control, are those people more dis predisposed to falling victim to social media use? Yeah. Um, impulse control is a, is a predictor of most um, addictive problems. So um, that goes with almost all, all addictions. Um, some, some addictions make it much worse. Social media is one of them. Um, alcohol is another one. Um, some drugs might serve to ameliorate that problem and make it better. Um, but certainly there's a, there's a, a bi-directional relationship between 
impulse control and social media use. Those who already have impulse control problems can be more susceptible to social media overuse, which makes the impulse problems more prominent, which then feeds back into their usage mm. again. So it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Yeah. That's super fascinating. And again, just, just to bring it back, like the, the idea that I am, this is an adaptive trait, presumably, right? You know, I'm, I'm literally training myself to have poor focus and impulse control. I mean, all of the things, things that you describe, I see to some extent in my life, such as when I'm cooking dinner, I'm very rarely cooking dinner. I'm listening to a podcast and then, Oh, I got to feed my dog. Oh, I forgot to do this thing today. I better write that down. So I don't forget. Oh, the thing's burning on the stove. I haven't really had enough water. I got to go fill up my, you know, I wouldn't say it's anything severe, but I'll, I'll occasionally notice I have these, these behavioral patterns and I'm like, man, I got to take the AirPods out and just do this thing. And, uh, that's something that I've really focused on the last couple months for myself, but I think so many people fall victim to that same pattern. We, we do, especially, especially in the last five, 10 years, I think it's gone much, much worse that we're all trying to do everything at once. And then there, there are multiple reasons for that one, that there's all this technology that allows us to do all of this stuff. I think also there's a bit of fear of missing out, um, mm -hmm. I, I mustn't miss this thing. I must, I must, must stay connected with everything. Uh, and interestingly, there's a, there's at the same time as that's going on, there's, there's an increase in the, the suggested use of mindfulness techniques. Um, and I, I'm not speaking about the full kind of Eastern philosophy mindfulness, um, which is a, which is a whole religious um, issue. But, but what we talk about mainly in the West when we talk about mindfulness is kind of focused attention and being with one thing while we're with it. So if you're cooking, then, then cook. Um, enjoy it. Go through the processes. Um, enjoy what you're doing. If you're listening to the sports station for the results, then, then do it. Um, be present for that that period and you'll get more out of it and, and mindfulness can be it doesn't have to be this this rather peculiar um, focus on your breathing now feel the breath going in and feel you don't have to do that you can just be with whatever you're doing um, and be present with what you're doing and that just have some cognitive effects um, not, not just in terms of, 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 of anxiety and depression and all of those things, but it actually reduces our susceptibility to habitual behavior. One of the studies we did is we, we set up a, it was a conditioning study. Uh, and one of the things about, about conditioning is that, that some of the, the responses we emit when we're being conditioned are stimulus driven uh, stimulus response of that, like that, that old fashioned way we, we see somebody just do it without being consciously aware of it and some of them are driven at the goal so there are two types of conditioned response it's quite a subtle um, procedure it turns out that if you give someone a mindfulness training before they condition far less of those conditioned responses are actually just unconscious SR responses. And many more of them are emitted for the purpose of getting at the goal they're working at. And the more you practice mindfulness, the more it is you're liable to keep that, that goal-directed action in mind, the less likely you are just to do things out of habit. Um, which, which can make us much more attuned to our environment, can make us much more of effective in what we're doing. And I'm not forgetting the most important thing, which is to actually manage to enjoy what it is that we're doing at the time, irrespective of whether it turns yeah. out the way that we, the way we want it or not. 
Yeah, and, and what I really appreciate about this part of the conversation is that – so I'm a fitness coach, and I – I don't know if it's just, again, to bring up the echo chamber thing. I am just riddled with fitness content online and I get so sick of it because there's so much conflicting information out there. You know, what diet do I follow? What's the optimal exercise program? Even, uh, you know, even as I'm, as I'm speaking this, this is an aside, but part of orating well is being able to hold a thought in your brain while you're talking around that thing for, for minutes at a time, Right. And I'm doing that now. And so it's very important as a host of a podcast to be able to focus singularly on an idea because I've got to hold it in my head while I'm, while I'm explaining myself. And, and the other aspect of it that you, you made me think of when you were saying this is that it doesn't have to be this mindfulness practice of, uh, of Eastern meditation and breath work. I personally, when I was maybe 18 or 19, I, I did a lot of breath work and that was sort of my starting point in the self-improvement thing. And I do think it's a pretty easy and accessible way to do so. But for anybody who sees it as like a hokey thing or, you know, maybe doesn't want to delve that deeply into it, it, it literally is as simple as on your drive to work in the morning when the radio station's on, listening to obviously pay attention to the street signs and roads but just listening to what <laughs> that's, the, that's a good place to be mindful when you're in that commute <laughs> that's 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 quite important <laughs> yeah making sure you stay safe on the road but you know listening to the person on the radio or reading a book and not getting not having to pick up your phone every chapter to make sure every you know nothing's waiting for you on your phone you can just keep reading everything's going to be fine but i do think that it's it's an important conversation to have is that the the access to the level of singular focus and in a way disciplined thought that you're talking about is as easy as not changing your behavior, just focusing on the behavior that you are engaging with. And over time, obviously, like you mentioned, those things will probably start to develop because you'll become, why am I doing this? I don't think this is very productive for me. I'm going to, I'm going to replace it with something else. I think that's absolutely right. And, and, Working on, on, on fitness and on that kind of body work, whether it's exercise or anything else, is, is a great example of where you can be mindful and where you can just focus on on the sensations of, of doing whatever it is you're enjoying doing in the moment. Um, and that's a, that's a really good way to to help mindfulness. And a lot of guys out there who, who don't really fancy all of this this kind of quite sort of uh, to use your word sort of a hokey breath work type stuff but we'll be we'll really happy to, to blast away on the treadmill mm. or, or do the weights in the gym they'll, they'll love that but while they're doing that while they're focusing on that and focusing on the feelings and they're only doing that they are being mindful and the more they can learn from that the, the better it's going to be um and it's, it's interesting while I'm, we're having this conversation. Um, this is the power, I think, of of, a, of an interpersonal conversation because I'm sure you hear about the, the, my, my email beeping away in the background every two minutes as, as we're speaking. Um, if I were not engaged with another person talking, it would become harder to ignore that po that focus being pulled. So I might be writing, and this wretched thing beeps away in the background. Oh, there's another thing coming in. Do I have to go and see what that is? It might be important, because it never is. But because you're engaged in a real social communication that you want to engage in, it's so much easier just to tune that out. Mm. Um, you can be mindful with another person because you're there in that conversation in the same way as you can be mindful while you're running or mindful while you're cooking um it's just saying staying focused what am i doing how's this feeling um and not getting this pulled in a thousand ways which that solo social media world that we often carry around with this is terrible at you can't be mindful when you've got six social media platforms pinging away at you 
Um, and you're thinking, do I need to answer that? Uh, is that something important? Your attention's all over the place. And ultimately, you just get habit driven. Mm. Um, going back to the, the studies, they seem to show if you want to get away from habits, just engage with what you're doing. If you want to call that mindfulness, great. Um, I'm quite happy to call it mindfulness. I suspect people more immersed in, in Eastern philosophy might see that as, as almost sacrilegious to, to <laughs> say that. Um, and I, I'm sorry for that, but um, from, from my perspective, it, it is, and it, it's helpful. Yeah. Is, is there anything that surprises you about the, the work that you do on social media use and addiction? I, th I think what surprises me most that I'm doing it. Um, I, I, I kind of got pulled into it about um, 10 years ago because I, 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 I may or may not be the last person in the world not to own a, a, a mobile phone, a cell phone. Um, I don't know. I presume there are still one or two arrests. My around. grandfather doesn't have a cell phone and I envy him all the time. Yeah, I, I, I suspect it's, it's, it's that old, there it goes again. I suspect it's that older generation um, thing where, where we're kind of holding out there. Um, so I, I never really gave it much thought. And really, it was, it was students who were, who were saying, you really should be looking at this. This is important. This is, this is something that we are, we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So... I think the most surprising thing for me is I'm doing it at all. Um, given my, my complete lack of technical ability um, and, and understanding of the nuances of mobile phone, I really don't even know how to turn one on. Um, <laughs> it, it's that level of, of incompetence. Um, so on, on some level, that's surprising to me. I think potentially more seriously it's just the i suppose it is a disappointment more than surprise that we have such a potentially great tool um to a communication across the world in ways that generations before have never had and it's squandered Mm. in such trivial ways. Um, and I just don't think people know what they've got most of the time. Um, I suppose my parents, who, who might have watched the original Star Trek mm. programs, well, I thought those, those, those things that they had in their hands, where, where you could flip them up and you could see the person you were talking to, that was like complete epitome of, of the use of science. And now we've got them. Um, and do we use them for anything important? Sometimes, but not often. Um, mm. And I think that the, the ease with which we, we lose the learning about how important this is uh, we all learned just how important this was in the pandemic. We learned its uses. We learned how it could connect people. We learned the ways in which it could be used pedagogically to teach. And two years after the fact, that all seems to have been forgotten again. Um, and I don't understand this. And there's, a, there's obviously a research project there to be done. Um, but that's surprising to me. That our unwillingness to to pick the good and just to keep doing the rubbish. Uh, Phil Reed, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add, sir? No, just a, thank you very much for allowing me to to have a chat with you. It's been really interesting. Um, I, I, I hope we've shown some of the benefits of, of modern technology, <laughs> having, having, having witted on negatively about it. I'm sorry about that. Um, but no, I, I, it's a fascinating area, one that is incredibly important for, for most of us now, uh, whether we want it to be or not. And I think I'll just leave people with the thought, use it for what you think is important, not for what you just get pulled into habitually. Hmm. 
Well, I, you know, I think that that is, um, we did talk a lot about the negatives, but it is good to draw attention to the importance of, again, being mindful of, of, of your own use. I certainly learned a, a lot from you and I, I think people listening will too. So, well, thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of good people. If you guys are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss our weekly uploads. If you feel so inclined, please share it with somebody you love, perhaps your grandma. We'll see you next time.